OK, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Jonathan Oxley. Uh, I am the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan Manager, uh, and I want to welcome you to this Team Lincolnshire Humber Zero webinar this afternoon. Um, just before we get started, uh, if I could ask you to turn your cameras off and to mute yourselves. This is predominantly to preserve uh, bandwidth for various participants on the webinar. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, also, as we run through the presentation this afternoon uh, and the discussion, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to pop them into the chat box at any time. Uh, if you do want to speak at some point, it'd be really helpful if you could raise your hand using the raise hand function within Teams. That'd be really, really helpful. Uh, and before we move on, I would like to extend a huge thanks to Joanne Andrews, who's actually going to be uh, doing all the hard work by uh, managing the slide presentations and a short video that we're going to have a little bit later uh, during the course of this afternoon's discussion and webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Jonathan Briggs. Uh, so that's going to confuse you. Now I have two Jonathans on the call, myself, Jonathan Oxley and Jonathan Briggs. Jonathan uh, Briggs, that is, is the uh, VPI project director for Humber Zero and he's going to tell you uh, all about that project. We also have with us this afternoon Jenny Sutcliffe. Jenny is a principal consultant for regulatory affairs with Philip 66, who are an integral partner of the Humber Zero project. We were due to be joined this afternoon by Jen Vincent uh, from the UTC to talk about skills. Unfortunately, uh, Jen sends her apologies. She's now no longer able to be with us in person this afternoon but she's very kindly sent us a short video which will tell us quite a bit about the different sort of skills aspects that we need to be thinking about as we move forward on this industrial decarbonisation and net zero journey. OK, those are the various uh, housekeeping activities, I think. Uh, please bear with us as we move forward. I hope that's uh, all going to run smoothly. I'm sure it will be. If we could move to the next slide, please, Joanne, that would be super helpful. Thank you. So there we go. My name is Jonathan Oxley. I am the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan Manager. The Humber Industrial Cluster Plan, for those of you who haven't heard, is what I variously describe as the architecture or the glue that brings all of the different projects in the decarbonisation space uh, around the Humber into one kind of coherent uh, story as to how we're going to take this forward to reach net zero by 2040. Uh, as you're aware, I guess the, the, the term decarbonisation, I'm hoping most of you understand that term, but just for those of you who don't, basically the elevator pitch for the work that we're doing here is tackling the climate change related emissions from our industry uh, and, and services across the region so that we can still have all the good, same goods and services that we want in the future, but do far less damage to the environment so that we've got a planet that remains habitable and preferably a little cooler than it is today for the generations to come. That's the elevator pitch. If we could move to the next slide, please, Joanne. Thank you. So the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan project is a partnership project. We have a range of different private sector partners, as you can see there, and strategic observers who all support us in our work, for which we are phenomenally grateful. And the project itself is led by the Hull and East Yorkshire Local Enterprise Partnership, which is where I'm housed. Uh, and it's funded by the uh, UK Research and Innovation Arm of the UK government. We also work very closely with our partners, Catch, who are supporting the delivery of this project. Next slide, please, Joanne. So what's it all about? I'm hoping at least one or two of you on this call might have seen this map before. This map is a really important tool to help understand how lots of the different elements of industrial decarbonisation and basically greening our industry and energy across the region, how it all comes together. Many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with various different aspects that are shown on the map. You can download this from our website, www.humberindustrialclusterplan.org, uh, so you can study it in far more detail than you can see on the slide here. Um, but you'll see various different things pictorially represented there, from the wind farms out in the east, uh, the, the North Sea, rather, to the east of us, to the gas pipelines, gas fields and such like, which will become an integral part of how we go about decarbonising the activity around the Humber and potentially further afield. Not many people actually realise that the area of the coast of our uh, Lincolnshire and East Yorkshire rather is actually phenomenally well placed from the point of view of carbon capture and storage by virtue of all the former gas reservoirs and salt caverns and such like that we have off our coastline. So we are fantastically well positioned for this sort of activity. The Humber is really the UK's energy estuary. 
around 25% of all the natural gas uh, flows in one form or another through the Humber uh, area. Yeah, around 25% of the UK's trade flows through the, the Humber area. Uh, we have vast amounts of low carbon electricity coming ashore. Uh, you probably all know this, and that's a fantastic thing for the Humber. What we need to do is find out how to do that in a much cleaner, greener way so we can meet the net zero or clean growth agenda that the, the government has certainly set for us and legislated uh, in Parliament, but also actually so that we can do the right thing by virtue of, of the planet and our uh, successes to come uh, on this earth. And of course, the important thing is that we need to be able to do this in a way which is sustainable. And I mean sustainable in the broadest sense of the word. So that means it needs to be sustainable for the people in our area, it needs to be sustainable for the businesses in our area, and it needs to be sustainable for the planet, of course, too. So sustainability in the grandest sense. And of course, the reason that the Humber is actually the UK's largest center of carbon dioxide emissions as an industrial cluster is because we make and produce so many of the goods that other people around, not only the UK, but actually all over the world want to buy. We are home to two of the last six refineries in our region. We've got the, the UK's largest power producer in our region. We've got one of the two remaining steelworks in our region. These are all fantastic things because they generate lots of value for the UK economy, for the people in our region, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to do is, first of all, safeguard those industries, but also actually importantly, work out where there may be opportunities that we can exploit in the future for businesses who perhaps don't see an obvious way to get to net zero. And the answer there is come and locate in the Humber. The Humber would be a great place to reposition your business as a net zero business. Here's the sort of thing that you can see on screen. We have the maps, we have the tools, we have the evidence, we, uh, evidence rather, we have the policy and reports in place that, that, that help you understand why relocating your business to the Humber might be a good thing to do or expanding your business to the Humber might be a good thing to do because we can help you get to net zero. Next slide, please. So collectively, and the big thing here is collectively, if we collaborate and do this in the right way, uh, the best way possible, and I'm talking about private sector enterprises, fantastic projects like Humber Zero, but also projects like Zero Carbon Humber, VNet Zero, other projects to do with the production of hydrogen, the implementation of low carbon electricity, new forms of hydrogen production. All of these different things are vital in order that we can effectively turn the tide on the UK's energy estuary and turn it towards clean green growth. And we'll only do that by working together. I often like to say, the technology is the easy bit, the harder bit is bringing the people along board, uh, people along, uh, getting the right policies on board and making all of this profitable so we can do it in a sustainable way. Without further ado though, it's my uh, great pleasure to now hand over to Jonathan, Jonathan Briggs, the VPI Project Director for Humber Zero. Jonathan is going to tell us a little bit more in detail about Humber Zero and how that's one of the fantastic and exciting projects that we have in our region. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, uh, thanks Jonathan. And, um... Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jonathan Briggs, the project director for Humber Zero. And um, just to follow on from great introduction from Jonathan and how we see Humber Zero fitting in to the the sort of the Humber story, we really see that there's a there's a couple of projects that really provide the platform for what I think Jonathan really uh, describes so well, which is the opportunities in the Humber and. Clearly for us, Humber Zero, given its size, its location, um, uh, and really the opportunity in terms of its concentration of industry, is one of the gateway projects to, to making, uh, to, well, to building that platform from which you have the opportunity to, to build this, this net zero industry in the Humber. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Sure. So, what is Humber Zero? Essentially, it's, it's quite simple. It's a, it's a collection, uh, it, it's the intention of Humber Zero is, is to decarbonize the Immingham site. And what that would that would represent is is up to 8 million tons of CO2, which is a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a very concentrated industrial site. Uh, as, as Jonathan said, there's two of the last six refineries located there. Um, over 25% of the UK's refining capacity. And then um, the Immingham plant itself generates up to 5% of the uh, UK's electricity demand, as well as supplying industrial heat to both of those refineries. So the three partners in this uh, phase of the project, we have 
that have established Humber Zero to date. Ourselves, uh, VPI, um, Philips 66, uh, in terms of the uh, Philips refinery and, and, and starting the decarbonisation journey there. And of course, we have um, Innovate UK as the investment partner from government um, as of um, a year and a half ago. Uh, moving to the next slide. Just a little bit more detailed as to the two industrial partners and what really constitutes the industrial hub uh, at Immingham. So in terms of the a bit more sort of um, uh, focus around the, the VPI Immingham combined heat and power plant. So it's large, 1.2 gigawatts, um, as I mentioned, up, up to 5% of the uh, UK's peak capacity generated there. Um, it provides both electricity to the grid, but also steam to the neighboring refineries. So 930 tons per hour, which is a, it's a large number, but essentially um, heat to 25% of the UK's refining capacity. And then of course it takes, it's, it's combined with the, the two refineries. So it's actually, everything is joined at the hip, if you like. So um, we are providing steam and heat. We're actually taking, um, off gases from the refineries as well. Um, the Philips 66 refinery is one of the, you know, one of the most advanced actually in Europe, but um, large scale, producing 36 million liters uh, processed per day, and in and of itself, 20% of the UK's domestic fuel supply. Um, it's already uh, in a position to produce. Um, some of the UK's first sustainable aviation fuel. Um, it is the it's Europe's only producer of battery coke. So that's going to be an important part of the supply chain as we um, produce electric vehicles. So uh, battery coke for, or premium coke for um, batteries being one of the um, key components. And really is kind of a, uh, overall is one of the refineries that, you know, is, is positioning itself very clearly to be you know, at the forefront of the energy transition uh, going forward. Um, next slide, please. So some of the benefits, a lot of these projects have huge benefits. They fit very well with uh, the, what the government is trying to do in terms of the net zero um, agenda, but also in terms of leveling up um, and creating this green industrial revolution. Um, so. In and of itself, uh, Humber Zero is going to capture 3.8 million tons per annum in this, in this first phase by 2027. Um, very much first of a kind technology that, that um, we're looking to deploy, both at ourselves, both at VPI and uh, at, at Philips. Again, the end journey is to decarbonize the entire Immingham site. So, starting off with 3.8 million tons per annum, and we're hoping to, to build that to 8 million tons per annum. So we're already taking a big chunk with this first phase of the project in terms of uh, capturing those emissions. Um, in terms of jobs, uh, from a, a permanent jobs perspective, uh, 200 permanent jobs we expect from the uh, infrastructure that we'll be developing both at the VPI site and also at the Philips 66 site. Construction jobs, this will be a major uh, construction project in the UK. And, you know, for a project of this size, we would expect a, about a peak, um, a peak construction job uh, addition of about two and a half thousand. And then in terms of, uh, as Jonathan said right at the beginning, what, you, what this really is largely about is positioning jobs to be safeguarded in the future as you go through, as you negotiate through the energy transition. So sustaining the, the Humber's position and the 20 odd thousand jobs that have, have been sort of earmarked around this area in terms of direct uh, industrial jobs, support for those industries, et cetera, is, is a major um, benefit for, for, from Humber Zero. Uh, next slide, please. So 
I think Jonathan has already set this up, but this is this is actually the the, the chart on the right. So it's the government um, depiction of where the industrial clusters are in the UK, and you can very clearly see uh, the Humber is right in the crosshairs of what the government is hoping to address by getting to net zero. Um, it's the largest industrial cluster. It has, as Jonathan says, already uh, a huge number of people employed in manufacturing and industry. So safeguarding those jobs is very much what this project and others is about. Um, a lot of those jobs are in the energy intensive industries. So really decarbonizing, you know, laying the platform as we are uh, with this project is really important to decarbonizing some of those uh, energy intensive industries as well. And and again, as I mentioned, the, the the impact on leveling up, providing investment in the areas that the government is hoping to, um, developing skills and expertise in those areas for the future, is very much what this is about in terms of just trying to sort of align this project with some of those objectives at a at a national level as well. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the key things about um, both the attractiveness of the Humber and also, to be to be quite honest, the, the, the Lincolnshire side of the Humber and where we are at Immingham is the opportunity for uh, CO2 storage via already two networks that are being developed, both of which um, we will be connected to. The first of which uh, has already been selected by government as a uh, store that's going to be developed, in this case, by um, BP and uh, other uh, major oil and gas companies, the Endurance or the East Coast Cluster Store. That's the red line going north of uh, the river and out to the Endurance um, CO2 store. And then actually, this is a unique position in terms of the industrial clusters in the UK. There's a second store that's being developed by Harbour Energy, that actually that's going to reuse facilities that already exist in terms of previous gas production facilities going through Thedlethorpe, and then the existing pipeline out to fields that will be um, depleted gas fields that be re reused for CO2 storage. So, Immium is a great position, first of all, in terms of providing connection to both those stores. It has huge advantages in terms of redundancy, um, robustness of that network in case of um, any disruption, but also in terms of just the Humber itself. It has a, it has access to, to CO2 stores, which, can, which, which is the primary route to decarbonizing industry and, and again, providing that platform for a future world that will need to be decarbonized. Uh, next slide, please. I won't say too much about this, um, apart from, uh, well, it's already been, I think Jonathan did a great job in terms of how we fit uh, in with the rest of the, the Humber. You know, clearly there's so much opportunity, so much diversity of industry. And really what we're trying to do is actually develop the infrastructure together so that fundamentally it'll be a place to attract industry and, and not just safeguard the existing industrial jobs in and around the Humber. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things, uh, one of the questions is how does it work and what does this process actually, um, uh, what does it entail? So uh, both the uh, Phillips 66 site and um, at the uh, VPI site as well. Both locations have, uh, the, the, the intention is to uh, build carbon capture uh, facilities at both sites. Both, both ourselves at VPI and Phillips 66 have actually selected Shell as a carbon capture technology provider um, and are currently working to develop the, the uh, technology around the existing site. And it just in terms of how does that work, it's actually a fairly, if I can move to the next slide, I can 
just give a brief sort of uh, description of the process. It's a, it's actually, it's a in in uh, in overall terms, it's it's actually a process that's been around for decades. Uh, this particular technology uses a particular mix of a solvent. The solvent is an amine, which when you contact it with a CO2 rich flue gas or process gas, um, if you contact it in an absorber tower, the solvent will actually attract and it'll, the CO2 will stick to it. And when you run that rich solvent through a, uh, a heater, um, essentially, and you actually heat up the solvent, the CO2 comes off in pure form. So the process is actually in very simple. Um, those pieces of infrastructure are quite large. Um, and actually, the, 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 the way, uh, the, 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 the key to, to get right when, as we're doing right now in terms of the design process, is getting the solvent to work at scale and regenerate and keep this process going when you have a large amount of flue gas that you're trying to actually capture small percentages of CO2. So that's the that's the, the way it works. And again, it's, it's the, the process or the technology has been around for years. Shell has, has done a lot of work to actually refine it so we can use it essentially um, economically and make it um, as efficient as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the last one for me is sort of how, what sort of timeline are we talking about? And um, right, so starting off at the beginning of this sort of timeline, so I, I mentioned that um, last year we were awarded, both ourselves and Philip 66 were awarded um, funding from uh, Innovate UK. So we have government as a partner through uh, Innovate UK. Uh, both um, the Humber Zero, in terms of both partners, are currently working through a feed program or a front end engineering and design. Um, we, as I mentioned, we've both selected technology uh, from uh, Shell, and we actually aim to to complete the the feed um, towards the the end of this uh, sorry beginning of um, next year or the middle of next year. Um, concurrent with that, we're actually um, we've been uh, working a public consult uh, consultation for planning. So we're working through the, the planning process uh, for consenting um, and, and permitting, and we're hope to, we're hoping to get into we're hoping to go into construction. Uh, in 2023, 2024, subject to, you can see a small disclaimer, a, a disclaimer at the bottom, which is essentially, a lot of this requires us to be working with government to get the right uh, policy framework to make a, and basically to deliver an economic project. All of this means that we hope to have the project up and running in 2026 and 2027. And as I mentioned, longer term towards 2030 is when we would hope to be really uh, following this on with other projects that will fully decarbonize the site. So that's kind of the overview of the project. I'll leave it there, I think, um, and hand it over to next slide and, and Jenny, I believe. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Yes, so uh, this slide really is to kind of touch on the, the culture and particularly the health, safety, environmental issues, the equality, diversity, inclusion um, and knowledge sharing um, that will be uh, such an important part of these projects as we move forward. Um, the Humber Refinery is uh, an upper tier coma facility and the BPICHP is a lower tier coma, coma uh, facility. So we're already subject to a very high, um, rightly a very high degree of regulatory oversight. Um, there are coma considerations of the developments on the um, existing plant um, and uh, to consider for the developments themselves. Um, there'll also be very large scale construction projects which carry their own health and safety um, issues. So uh, HSE, um, 
working safely, ensuring that the plants are safe is really, really key to the development of these projects. Um, uh, another um, almost equally as important issue um, is the equality, diversity and inclusion. Say almost because if safety, if you don't get safety right, then really nothing else matters. But uh, um, very close behind is equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, this uh, this has become such an important issue um, and I'll talk a bit more about it on the next slide. Uh, but it, yeah, again, ensuring that it's a, a fair workplace, respectful workplace, that we build in equality and embrace diversity and inclusion um, through the through these projects is is really important and something that particularly the government is um, really actively looking for. Um, and also uh, what builds into into this is knowledge sharing of the project. Again, we're developing these projects in partnership with Innovate UK and what is effectively um, government funding. Uh, it's really important that we share the lessons that we learn through the development of these projects. Um, government's looking for that to be disseminated out through the supply chain. Um, and other collaborators to try and ensure that um, we we can learn as quickly as possible, incorporate those learnings through other projects so that we can really deploy um, carbon capture and storage technology as quickly and as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Um, Levelling up has been mentioned again key to really bring those benefits to the supply chains and to the regions. Um, uh, that these uh, technologies are going to be built in to try and level up the regions and make sure that the benefits are brought, uh, brought to those regions um, for the benefit of the whole of the UK. Um, and again, this is as a kind of a first mover advantage in this carbon capture and storage how is used elsewhere in the world, um, but has not been widely deployed for the purpose of carbon dioxide emissions abatement um, so this is something that really the UK is looking to try and get ahead of um, and deploy um, so that we can then um, use that. We build the skills, we build the supply chains within the UK that that can then become something that's exportable to the rest of the um, to the rest of the world. And therefore not just safeguard the industry that we have, but really uh, create new opportunities new industries, um, new technologies that we can, um, that can benefit the UK supply chain and economy. Next slide. And so uh, just to touch a little bit more on uh, the um, diversity and skills that are needed for the energy transition. Um, and this is really just gets to the heart of why um, not just equality, but inclusion and, and diversity are so important. Um, really, it's important now for any businesses anywhere um, to have a healthy culture, respectful culture, um, but also through the diversity of um, ideas, you become more competitive. So um, really, it's better for business. It's not just a, you know, a, a nice to have, if you like, although it's you know, incredibly important in that sense, um, but it is a competitive issue. Um, and also touching back on the um, safety considerations of the projects, the plants um, that these projects are being um, uh, developed on are already, you know, in, often, in many cases, coma facilities or have safety considerations. The projects themselves will have the safety considerations and a diversity of perspectives, again, is important for um, for a safety culture, for kind of an open safety culture and through understanding um, you know how things might be perceived differently and therefore, therefore we improve your safety performance, your safety culture. Um, are so critically important today to have inclusion and diversity. Um, we talk a lot about um, green skills and what's going to be needed for the energy transition. Um, and uh, again, the, a lot of those skills really exist in industry now. So the carbon capture plant that Jonathan described on a previous uh, slide is 
is a, a chemical processing plant similar to the sorts of things that we already have in industry already. Um, and so the skills really are very much transferable um, from existing industry to these new technologies. Um, and those are, of course, science, technology, engineering, maths, but also it is the more of the hands on the um, the technicians, the construction, these plants are, are going to be very large scale construction pro projects. And if um, you know, we look at that just for the Humber Zero project and it's significant. But then when you think back to that uh, Humber um, map, which uh, both Jonathan's uh, showed and mentioned in their slides, uh, there's all of those construction projects potentially going on in the region. So um, very much uh, a demand on construction workforce um, and really any skills that you can think of that are needed for business and industry and infrastructure today it doesn't just have to be stem but it can be communications it can be accounting it could be um you know there's a, an awful lot of work going on the ecology sides of things and biodiversity um just uh, just re really anything that you can think of um is needed, it will be working in the energy transition uh, in the Humber um, in the future. Um, for the energy transition, um, you know, this is kind of the flip side of the, the sort of first box, which is, you know, you need your inclusion and diversity for your core skills. Well, actually, and so for the energy transition, you actually need it even more because the energy transition is going to require more innovation, more collaboration, more problem solving to really make these technologies work, to deploy them at scale um, at uh, all of the locations that they are needed for, including the Humber Zero project. But then you also have to kind of tie into the networks, work with the networks. Um, and there's so much interlinking that's needed. Um, so again, the diversity of backgrounds, the diversity of skills, um, is all critically important to try and bring these together to um, for the for the energy transition. And on the hum so on the Humber Zero project, um, of course, we have been engaging. Um, we've been doing a lot of local outreach, engaging with businesses, academia, associations, and government. Really, at a level that um, you know is you know is much much higher than you would see in a you know in a business as usual situation um a lot more communication with the public uh, to try and make sure that we are engaging with the supply chain we are getting the message out there um so that uh the opportunities are clear to everybody um and we can really sort of pull together work together and promote these projects and make them happen next slide So I think this is over to the uh, video of Jen Vincent. Hi, I'm Jen Vincent and I'm from Engineering UTC Northern Lincolnshire. I am the careers leader here at the UTC. Um, I've been in the role approximately two years now, um, having previously worked for North and North East Links Council, a careers and enterprise company and Department of Work Conventions. So my background's always been around employment and skills, predominantly within the Humber, Greater Lincolnshire area. So a little bit about the UTC. So we're one of 48 across the country. Um, they, they were created in 2015 when the government worked out that students were leaving school without any understanding of the labour market, the jobs that are around an area and having very little employability skills. So we were brought in to try and bridge that gap, connecting the education to the real world. Um, and we do lots of projects, challenges. Um, we can't come off curriculum. We can't do that. Students have to pass an exam and that's with every secondary school in the country. But what we can do is bring employers into the curriculum. So say if we're teaching physics and we're doing titration, we can look at, right, so we've got lime quarries around the area. Can we bring one of those in? Fractional distillation. So we're, we're, we're very lucky to have the Humber refineries, 
on our do doorstep that can support that with, with fractional distillation and various other things as well. So we specialise in engineering and now in health sciences and social care. So we follow the labour market, what is needed within the labour market and the U2Cs do that across the country. Now in our area, in Lincolnshire, we absolutely know that we've got a massive issue with the amount of carbon that we are generating. You know, the, the people that went before me have told us that. Now, the people that are going to be delivering this and delivering these targets by 2050, they're in school now. They're only going to be 40 by the time that all of these technologies are in place. And then we're moving on the technologies. That's to get to net zero, but to get to net minus, and to get the world back to how it should be, these are the people that will be the managers at that point in the future. So it is about engaging them now. Um, so at the UTC, we're academic, practical and technical learning. Uh, we've got expert dedicated staff. A lot of our staff are ex-industry, um, ex-forces as well. Um, and we work with core partners and universities. So we work with both of our local universities really closely. Uh, we've got a combination of GCSE and A-level qualifications as well as OCR level three qualifications and coming into T-levels. We've all, all heard the word T-levels coming up um, and I'm sure all the employers on here, if you haven't, you will hear about that over the next year. And all of our students have an extensive careers programme that's built in uh, lessons every week and then through the lessons that they're in as well. So what are schools doing to engage business? So business, it's not your job to engage schools. You've got a job to do. Your job is to make money, be successful. Your targets are not the same as our targets. But if we don't engage schools right now, what's going to happen is we're going to have a massive skills gap coming through. Um, so we're gonna have, if you look at a 13 year old now, 13 year olds are saying, yes, I want to work in this industry. I want to do this. I want to work with animals. Well, that's all, that's all fine and good. However, working with animals, we live in the Humber. We've got no zoos. So actually all of those transferable skills and understanding the labor market now and what net zero looks like, what carbon capture looks like, it has to be brought in from age 13 to be inspired and take it through. So how can you best engage with schools to deliver the messages? So the best way to engage schools is to contact a careers leader. So every school's got one. So around 2018, uh, the Department for Education said every school needs a nominated careers leader and it's their role to oversee careers across the whole school. So sometimes before, if you try to contact the school and say, right, let's do something with the school, you might have not have spoken to the right person. So please contact a careers leader and say, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. This is how we'd like to engage schools. So we've got targets for meaningful encounters and careers in the curriculum. So a meaningful encounter isn't necessarily a careers fair where you stand in a drafty hall. A draft would be absolutely lovely right now, but you don't have to stand in a drafty hall for eight hours where everybody wants your pens. So this is about what is being taught and how can my company get into that? If we're teaching something in physics around electricity, how can I get my logos on that screen? How do students know where my apprenticeships are? How do students know what our graduate scheme is? So it's about looking at the school locally um, or, or your local college or your university and saying, right, as a company, how do we get involved in this? Something like work experience. Now work experience is so valuable and we know it's so valuable but a lot of companies don't take work experience because it's time consuming it's massively time consuming on on the business on the people that are looking after those students and it's how can we do this talk to your careers leader at your local school talk to your college and say right we want to do work experience but how do we break it down how do we take somebody on for a week 
and make it meaningful. Now we can do that. It's not your job to do that. That's ours in education and we can give you the support to do that. If you take somebody on work experience and they are so valued and valuable on that work experience, keep the details because at some point they will come out of college, out of the university, you want them on a T level, you want them on a placement. So, so those students will remember you if you make that valuable. And as well as we come out with COVID, there's more opportunities to visit education and to bring education to you. Now, we're not saying you're a small company, you've got 15 employees, let's have a coach load of 60 students. We're saying, can you get four there? You know, can they come and visit your business and look at, right, can we do some sort of competition? Can you link up with some bigger companies and say, right, love to join whatever's going on in the business world and 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 really support um inspiring students now you can do that with stem ambassadors there's the waterline summit that that the marketing humber have just done which is really really exciting competition for students so there's lots of various ways that you can get involved and what i would say is look for the biggest impact in the smallest amount of time. If you go to a careers fair for eight hours and stand there giving away pens, you may have inspired one child once. But if you can get into the curriculum and have a maths lesson that goes ahead where they're talking about percentages and you've sent some data in with your logos all over it, that can be delivered term on term on year on year and become a library piece for the school that they keep rolling out. So it's about your product placement as well. And I think sometimes we forget that there's marketing of your own company within there. So uh, working with core industry experts, some of the things we do here is industry based projects, health and safety talks, uh, skills building on our workshops, mock interviews, absolutely incredibly important if you can go and support a school with some mock interviews you'll get so much value out of that personally um, it obviously it hits your csr which is always great uh, get some photos rah rah it up on your social media it's all about that marketing and that sales of your company um sponsored ppe and equipment we have here business lunches, one-to-one -one mentoring, uh, university site visits and work placements. So that's some of the things that we do. But if you look at the majority of universities, colleges and schools, they do this as well. So you can look at what, what time can my company give? Um, and if your company can give a little bit of a time, make it meaningful. So net zero. Now we know this, so we've got to get to 2050. Now what we've got at schools is we've got a little bit of talk about it in geography. We've got a bit in engineering. Now not all students do geography and engineering. So as part of making their choices in year 10 as to what GCSEs they do, they can opt out of geography and they can opt out of engineering. Now in PSHE, um so that's like 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 values um learning they've got a little bit about net zero global goals in there but other than that it doesn't sit within the curriculum so carbon capture it's not there you know we're one of the the humber creates more emissions than most other areas and it is it, the biggest in the uk for the emissions but it's not being taught unless students come off curriculum. So it's about how do we get together and how do we teach this going through? So if we're going to go down the route of carbon capture, absolutely amazing, Home for Zero um, and, and all the companies involved are really creating some amazing stuff. But if we're not inspiring them at age 13, when they come out at 16, 18, 21, they're not going to be ready for it and we're going to have to train them differently. So to train them from one labour market into actually you want to do this is, is more difficult. At age 13 to 15 specifically, if you can get them to take, make the right choices and support with, with 
you know so so we're going to you're looking at triple science or you're looking at geography brilliant we absolutely need that we need that in our industry and give that valuable meaningful encounter then it will make things easier as it goes up and actually it's really simple really impactful and really quick so education needs to adapt quickly to teach the principles of global change within the curriculum we absolutely do so we don't make the lessons up ourselves we're led by the lessons so we're told what is taught within each lesson and that comes from the department for education and the different examining boards so we can't take a student completely off curriculum all the way through and say right we're just going to learn all of these different things because at the end of their learning whether that's 16 or 18 they'll be examined based on what the curriculum says so it's about getting into that curriculum, having that product placement within there, coming in and doing some lunchtime sessions or maybe after school or finding out when students do come off curriculum. Now, that's not an issue of yours. That's that's an issue of ours. That's an issue where the government needs to change these things. And we absolutely know that. And schools and colleges, are, you know, we're fighting the change. Uh, maths. Why on earth in the maths exam does it say Johnny's got 14 apples and Susie's got 12? How many apples all together? Why are we still talking about apples? Young people don't buy apples. Young people need to know really important things locally. You know, that they, they need to know what's a let, what's the percentages within an area? How do we work that out? OK, I'm actually putting it into something into the real world. But what can't happen is we can't do it by ourselves. Teachers are masters of their craft, absolute masters of, of their craft. You, you've got 30 students six times a day. Now, within those 30 students, you've got people within the classroom who might have special education needs, might not be able to shut up. <laughs> that's always a real fun one or might be really really bright so you've got your low achievers your middle achievers your high achievers your excitable students the ones where you've explained everything and then say so what what do you want me to do then so what they've got to do is have the pedagogy to teach those 30 students a lesson six times a day five days a week that's their craft they don't know your craft now, your craft is the craft that will take them to success after their exams. Your craft is the one that is that important labour market information, the changes that are coming up and um, the developments of business. So what I would say is if you can get into a school and work with a school, just really, really important that you do that and then you can support. Now, I'm not here today for questions, unfortunately. I'm halfway up the mountain right now. So if you do have any questions, um, if you contact the guys on the screen, they can get hold of me. My email address is j.vincent at enlutc.co.uk. Um, and I'm more than happy to put you in touch with STEM ambassadors, careers and enterprise company, uh, the local universities, anybody that you think that you need to look after because it's not just about my children it's about all of the children in the whole of the greater lincolnshire area to make sure that we achieve this thank you wonderful and thank you to jonathan jenny and jen there for their fantastic presentations just before we move into the q a session which uh, i hope you've all got a few uh, thoughts perhaps on things you might want to ask I, I just want to provide a little bit of reflection because both jenny and jonathan in particular talked about how important this is um you'd expect with all due deference you'd expect my colleagues at humber zero uh philip 66 vpi etc you'd expect them to talk very glowingly about their projects and how important they are of course they would and they do but it's not just them that are saying how important and how much of an opportunity this is the world economic forum the the people that you may have heard of in the past holding uh various conferences at places like davos they published some work uh, quite recently that said industrial clusters are going to be absolutely key to reaching net zero. 
And they went so far as to say there are two really important industrial clusters to keep your eye on in the world. There's one in China, where they have a slightly different way of doing things, and the other is the Humber. So these are people who are used to sipping uh, champagne and eating caviar and doing mega million pound deals and everything else, rightly or wrongly, they know where the Humber is. People on the world stage actually know where the Humber is, arguably perhaps better than some people who might even live in our own country. So this is not just Humber Zero saying this is a fantastic opportunity. This is not even Zero Carbon Humber saying this is a fant fantastic opportunity. These are independent voices and minds of investors and key business people and world leaders who are looking to the Humber and seeing the fantastic opportunity that we have to get net zero, uh, to achieve net zero in the Humber, and therefore the opportunity for these projects to be lighthouse projects that other people in the world are interested in. And already I've had conversations with people from California, from Houston, from the Netherlands, from Germany, all saying what's going on in the Humber and how are you making it happen? What can we learn from you? I've had investors ring me up and ask me about, you know, what can they invest in in the decarbonisation world in the Humber? Typically, you know, we invest a few hundred million to a few billion uh, euros. What can we possibly invest in? Those are the sorts of conversations and questions and, and such like that are going on at the moment. And I think that's an absolutely fantastic opportunity for the Humber. However, it's not what I think, it's what you think too today. And so it's important that we move on to some questions. Uh, I'm going to open the floor and invite any of you to put your electronic hands up. But before we do, I can see Richard. Richard has posed a question uh, in the chat box there. Uh, are VPI and Philips 66 confident that 2,500 skilled construction workers will be available when needed? So I guess that's a question that you might want to pick up, Jonathan, in the first instance. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, so uh, Jenny mentioned actually that so a lot of this, a lot of these projects coming on at the same time, it'll be a challenge. Um, but but I think you know the the work that uh, projects are doing, in particular this one, Humber Zero, in terms of bringing in the EPC partners early, engaging them early, so they're actually trying to uh, to, to engage to get the right skills, trades, etc. Um, ahead of time, it's it's an issue for sure, and and one that that's going to be um, one that it'll be a challenge, but but we feel we can manage it. And I, thank you, Jonathan. And I think the important thing, Richard, is that those conversations are starting now. In fact, they've already started. And, and we recognise the sort of scale of challenge that we might have here around uh, resourcing these projects, not only the projects of, uh, that are going on in the Humber, but the Northwest uh, also is working on decarbonisation. We've got Teesside that's working on decarbonisation. We all know that we're going to need more than just these decarbonisation projects to come to fruition if we're going to meet the net zero target. And then you overlay that, of course, with things like EDS construction of, of Hinkley Point and hopefully Sizewell C if that comes to pass, and HS2 if we're still building elements of HS2. These are all phenomenally important engineering and construction projects that need to take place and all of that is overlaid or underpinned depending on your point of view by business as usual so jonathan and his team at vpi jenny and their, her colleagues at philip 66 will be doing all their usual turnaround and statutory inspection work as well as all this additional construction work so so the answer is no I, how confident are we we're we're confident that we're doing all the right things now to get these uh, skills and people in place uh, and ultimately to bring this to fruition on the sorts of timelines that Jonathan uh, explained earlier. Does that help answer your question, Richard? Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, cheers. You're welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. Any any other questions from uh, our attendees this afternoon? OK, on, with fantastic time in there. Rachel has just posted something else in the chat box. Thank you, Rachel. What supply you, what supply chain opportunities are there or will there be within the Humber Zero project for businesses within Greater Lincolnshire? Great question, Rachel. It's something we are uh, actively pursuing at the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan, our study work around supply chain considerations, but I know the Humber Zero project also have something to say on this. So again, I'm going to hand back to uh, Jonathan for that. Yeah, you, well, you, you covered it. I mean, so we're trying to do, so we're trying to work as a sort of group through through the Humber Industrial Cluster so that we're actually combining our efforts and coordinating. But I think every single project has engaged um, the contractors through. A, we held a supply chain event um, earlier this month 
and I know one of them, I'm pretty sure that uh, Robert might keep me give me the exact date, but we, we've had a we've had um, really good turnout for that. We had over a hundred people, in fact, at, at an event that we had uh, earlier uh, in Scunthorpe. In Scunthorpe. And, and and that and that's right, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, you know, supply chain event for Humber Zero. We've had other engagement activities too uh, on the north bank of the river. There have been a number of different supplier events uh, where we we effectively open our doors or our partners open our doors for discussion space. A little bit like this, but maybe taking up a half to a whole day where you've got the opportunity to hear more about what's going on, some of the timing issues, an opportunity to speak to people like Jonathan, Jenny. Uh, Robert and colleagues about how this is all going to unfold. Uh, Jonathan and Jenny both, of course, rightly pointed out that this is all subject to, you know, some of the government's policy work uh, as they uh, seek to get their own heads around how they need to kind of set the right policies in place. Um, so ultimately, yes, please keep your eye out for future supply chain events. Robert has just said 29th of June was the last one uh, at Forest Pines, I believe. But there will be many more of these activities coming up uh, facilitated by partners like Catch, like NOF, uh, others who are active in this space too. And if you haven't heard about any of them, do please visit the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan website or indeed the Humber Zero website. You'll find opportunities to sign up for newsletters that will give you more up to date information about what's coming up shortly. So I see Lee has his hand up. Lee, over to you. Hi Jonathan, thank you. Uh, it's it's not a question, it's more uh, an offer of support really. I, I work very closely with Jen uh, and what she spoke about at the UTC is, is on scale uh, and this needs to be delivered on scale, so not just directly towards the ET UTC who have a curriculum that is designed for this type of work, but to, to all schools that maybe don't have that type of curriculum. Uh, now, the offer of support is I manage the uh, the careers hub at the Greater Lincolnshire LEP. I'm the strategic careers hub lead. Uh, we are working with all 122 educational establishments in Greater Lincolnshire, and this uh, is recognised as one of our game changing sectors uh, from the Greater Lincolnshire LEP. So the offer of support is, uh, as and when you know what and where, please do get in touch, and we can we can uh, broker the relationships with schools. And a lot of the things Jenny speaks about around linking careers to the curriculum are themes of ours at the moment. And we have uh, as Cornerstone employers working with us already, Philip 66 and a number of other employers. In, in fact, 107 employers working with us across Greater Lincolnshire, across various sectors. So uh, again, I'll finish there just by saying, as and when you know what and how, let us know and we're there to support. Brilliant, thank you very much, Lee. That's really helpful. Uh, and just for the avoidance of doubt, whilst I'm employed by the Holland East Yorkshire Local Enterprise Partnership, well, we do work very closely with the Greater Lincolnshire LEP too, and we're absolutely taking a pan humber approach to all of this activity. And in fact, when you think about the sorts of numbers of jobs and skills that we will need, and indeed supply chain considerations, you know, the reality is we won't be able to resource all of this from within the humber. But what we, what we very much should do is seek to make the most of how we can resource it and develop the most for our economy and our people and our businesses in the region, first and foremost, before we then realise where else we need to, to go to access some of these skills uh, and such like. I see that uh, Laura has very helpfully posted one of the websites uh, in there for the uh, Humber Zero Suppliers page. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, the other one, as I mentioned earlier, is www.humberindustrialclusterplan.org.org. So again, you can find out about all of the different activities for suppliers coming up uh, as and when they unfold. Uh, and Lee also has very helpfully posted his link to the career sub. Thank you, Lee. That's brilliant. A any further questions or reflections or thoughts from our audience this afternoon? All is quiet. That's fantastic. I think I can probably hear a few fans whirring in the background too. Uh, well, I think it's all, all that it remains for me to do then is to thank again uh, Jonathan and Jenny and uh, Jen Vincent uh, for their presentations today. That's been uh, really appreciated. I think I see already one or two comments appearing in the chat to that effect. That's been wonderful. Um, I think I'd also like to extend a thank you to Team Lincolnshire who uh, have hosted this event this afternoon and have put it on and advertised it and run it for us. That's been really, really helpful. Uh, and I think please keep watching this space, keep watching for the developments in the Humber as far as decarbonisation goes. And when you speak to your family, your friends, your suppliers, your colleagues, tell them about how wonderful the opportunities are for everybody in the Humber that are going to last for uh, years and years and years to come and possibly develop some new careers on the back of it. 
So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time this afternoon. I wish you all well, and uh, I hope that maybe I pass across either electronically or in person at an event before too long. Thank you.